and we're going to start in a, the process of showing you how to set what is known as the Tiffany Solitaire. Now, I use that word because it's become the word kind of like, you know, you say, uh, I'm going to Xerox something, yet we know Xerox hasn't been around and, and there's no Xerox machines. But that word was picked up and used um, again and again for other meanings. And same thing. So when you talk about a Tiffany Solitaire, it was Tiffany and Company that came up with their very simple and classic and classy way to set a stone and in a particular type of mounting. The Tiffany Solitaires either had four prongs or six prongs, and sometimes eight, but all of them still, as long as it was just the simple prongs and the shank, the shank being the portion that goes around the finger, that was referred to, and Tiffany and Company was the first one to come up with it, and hence Tiffany Solitaire carried forward all these years, over, you know, a hundred years, and is used generically anymore for a classic setting. So if I say this is a Tiffany Solitaire style, that's what it really is. It's not a Tiffany and Company piece, but it's a Tiffany and Company style. This is a great stone to be able to start learning and using to be able to set some of the other stones. It's also forgiving. Sapphire is the second hardest gemstone next to diamond. It's a carat 58 Kanchanaburi. Kanchanaburi is a place I've been to, it's been actually a couple of weeks. It's where the bridge over the River Kwai is in Thailand. There's a big Bopoi mine there. Um, that produces all those wonderful black spinel pieces that you might see in carvings and also the wonderful Thai sapphires. And that's what you're seeing here. It's one of the darker kind of a inky blue, not the midnight blue, so it's not that dark, but it is a nice kind of an inky blue. So we have our stone, we have our mounting. The first thing you do is measure the distance of the stone. What we do next is, this is the millimeter gauge, and like I said, we have to work with millimeters at the bench. Millimeters are the only small enough designated uh, measurement that gives you the accuracy you need to be able to pick the right burr. Burr, we'll talk about that and show you that in just a moment. So what we do, we need to know the distance of cross that the stone is. In other words, the diameter of the stone. So we just bring it in and we go across what would be the center uh, diameter of the stone and then we can read what that exact setting says and get the millimeter size of it. And as we look and turn this back, we can look and see, yes, it's right at the six and a half millimeter mark, which is again, like I said, equivalent to the weight of a diamond. Yet because sapphire weighs heavier, that's why it weighs you know, the specific gravity. That's why it weighs more like over a carat and a half. So we know the distance of our stone, right? All right. So to make sure that we're using the right mounting and the right stone, we're going to set the stone over the top of the mounting just to make sure that we're using uh, the burr we pick is going to fall in the right place of where we want it. So I'm seeing where the sapphire fits on the mounting and it falls just to the kind of halfway across the prongs. I have found that I get a lot more control by using this burr. Now I call it a 90 degree bearing burr because the angle between the bottom and the top will fit into a right angle. In other words, a 90 degree angle. And this shape, why I like it so much, because if you turn it upside down, it gives you the exact look of what the di a profile of a diamond or most gemstones are. In other words, most gemstones, you know, have the angled crown that comes back up and the pavilion that angled down. So I'm finding here that there's three very close to the ones I want to uh, work with. And what I'm going to do is, because these, I can see they have some buildup of wax, which is what you use to help lubricate the burr, and they have some buildup of other um, gold from where they've been used in the past. We're going to steam these off. And it's nice to have the steamer, of course, where we can do that.
And that's as simple as it is. Now the heat that it's caused uh, these to be able to heat up to, I can already see the water's drying off. It has cleansed the burrs to be able to start fresh. We have our flex shaft. We have our burr that matches and corresponds to the size of the sapphire. Now, if there's times when you may want to use a burr a little bigger or a little smaller, that's going to come with practice. That's going to come with just being able to do this over and over, with, depending on the stone and depending on the actual angles the stone is cut at. Okay, so we've dipped the burr into our beeswax, and you just put it in the beeswax with the burr spinning. That's all. It picks it up just very little bit along the edges. And that's all you need. And now I can see from my angle at this, and then we'll turn it from the side. But first, we're just going to apply speed and start off slowly, and it will cut away the metal as we go. So we only cut so far down. Then what we do, we spin the mounting uh, 90 degrees so that we can look at it from the other edge so that we're cutting that seat level, so that we're cutting it even from both ways because you don't want it to be crooked. And you want to cut it in the mounting to what depth you want the stone set. Certain clients want stone set higher. Other clients may want the stone set as low as possible. All right, so now we've kind of gone around. Let's take a look and you can see where it has cut and removed the metal and created what's known as the seat. So we've cut those seats a little deeper, a little, we've cut back a little further into the gold, into the prong. You don't really want to ever go much more than a third away into the metal. You, um, a half at the most, depending on the thickness of the prong. Because if you do more than that, you're going to be making the outside of the prong too thin. Uh, there you go. You might have even heard the little bit of a snap that it gave us. And this is what you want. If we look at this, our stone now is in the seat. It is in the mounting. And it is going to be straight if it doesn't appear yet. We, as we bend the prongs over, that's how we control the level of it. You can see it's fitting all the way down. It's right where we want it. Now I'm going to use additional higher power to come in and see if when I bend those prongs over, are the prongs, when they bend, are they going to bend at the junction of the girdle? And this is real important. Or are they going to bend freely without touching the girdle, which guarantees you you're not going to chip your stone. This is where and the difference between a mediocre jeweler that breaks, has a higher average of breaking stones, or a master goldsmith that takes the time to do it correctly and has a much lower breakage rate. So what all I'm doing, and we'll show you in a minute, is Just removing a little bit of metal. On the inside of each of these prongs. That that other burr did not remove or did not come in contact with. And I'll show you that in just a minute. It'll be very, it'll be very uh, obvious. This is one of the most important things you can choose, is what works for you. Now, after all these years of doing this, uh, I have found a pair of pliers that is not a traditional pair that you would ever think works for stone setting. But those uh, that I have made believers in it, believe in it. Now, you 
can and I don't even have a pair of the very expensive. I think they're like forty dollars. They're uh, made for stone setting. They have the little stops and breaks on them and these kind of things. And then gem setting pliers, very expensive. If you have a pair of those, if you like using them, that's fine uh, for those of you that do that. But let me tell you, I uh, I don't like them. I'm not comfortable with them, and so it's to each his own. Now. Here is the classic little needle nose. These are great for doing fine work. Let's say if you're doing a little four prong setting and it's a small diamond, these are great for folding over smaller items. So you're gonna find that a nice needle nose pair of pliers is gonna be very useful at times. We're setting though a bigger solitaire. So my use for these right now, no, that's not my choice. The, this pair of pliers that you see, these, as you can tell right here, have a notch where the prong actually would go. And in effect, this is the way that would work. So you put your mounting in there and you would press, put the prong in that notch and you would press it over and fold the prong over. Uh, occasionally, I find a use for these. So to have these at the bench, I actually use them for other uses than stone setting, but they can be effective uh, more so than those fancy and expensive gem setting pliers. But the best ever, ever I found are these. What I'm going to do is I'm going to only partially move a prong over by a, and see how my finger is in between my finger is in between allowing it to be the break and so we partially move one of the outside prongs over the edge of the stone and if you can see you can see now that that is angled over a little bit more so than the other one right so now we look at our stone, we get, make judgment at, even as early at that point as to if it is set, going to be able to be set at a level position. Now you can see where the prong is bent over on both of those two outside prongs. And I'm liking where, what I'm seeing. So now I go ahead and start applying the pressure to one of the other corner, what would be a corner prong, so to speak and I fold it partially over. Never all the way because you may have to pull the prong back and you, if you push it all the way, you're gonna push the stone out of its seat as I've done a little bit here, okay? If you look at it this way, you might be able to see that the stone may be a little bit uneven, but that's okay because we're going to now apply pressure to the opposing side which may very well, hopefully, fix that and correct that because we're doing it slowly. This is not a time to rush at this point of the game. What we have now, we, our stone is set. We need to file and get those prongs smaller. And I use the word file. That's kind of like saying, again, Xerox. It's a word that is used, but you don't use a file but it means the same thing. We're gonna sand these prongs down and get them to the shape we want them. And I find, again, my little device uh, called a Moore sanding disc works really well for that. I can see how close I'm getting because it's magnified. And I can tell I'm not hitting the stone. What I do next is I take what is called a cup burr, and it's literally that. It's an inverted burr that's a cup that has the cutting uh, little edges on the inside of the burr. And I think maybe you can see them there. They come in different sizes. Here's another size uh, you can see here, and they make them in real smaller sizes. So what you do is you find the proper size cup burr that will fit the prong that you have created and that you want to be able to round up. 
So here we go. We put it over the stone. Now I'm looking at it and I can tell that the edge of that cup burr is not touching the, uh, the stone. And it only takes a few moments. Now you can see the difference a cup burr makes. It creates that nice finish to the prong. It rounds the front of it, rounds the top of it. So uh, I like what I see and it also takes away the sharp edges. Once your stone is set and level, you have 90% of the job done. The rest goes very quickly and you have all the liability done for breaking the stone. Next, I use a, a bristle brush and I do probably 90% of my finishing at the bench. Very little is done on the buffer behind me. So there's a particular polish I also like to use at the bench. Of course there's Tripoli, there's a yellow glow, what's called a yellow glow, that's right there. The Tripoli is a type of polish that you see that is for like platinum and very uh, coarse scratches. This is a semi-polish and your final polish is a red rouge right here. That's your final polish. In the process of working at the bench, red, Ru red rouge, I don't use. Tripoli, seldom use. Yellow glow, almost always use. It's a good polish because I know right there the finish on the top of those prongs is a really fine finish. In other words, it's not a coarse finish. So it's not going to take a lot to be able to put a finish on those. And we can do this right before your eyes. And this is where, for most stones, you can just apply the pressure and polish on top of them. But not calcite, not fluorite, and not apatite. Hardness of fiber below, this yellow glow, this Tripoli will literally scratch and round the facets on your stone. And if you've ever gotten one back from your jeweler and wondered what happened to your stone and he tries to say, oh, nothing, well, yes, something did happen, and it happened because he chose the wrong polish at the final step. So look at this. A beautiful carat 58 Canton Knobbery Sapphire set in 14 karat gold. You saw every step of the process. Very cool, I think, indeed. And I, you know, no matter how many times I've done this, every time I finish a piece, it just feels like that's an accomplishment. It took a lot of years of training and a lot of years to perfect this. And, you know, what I made look simple was only because it came to me very naturally. Other people, maybe not so much, just like playing a guitar. Some people come and pick it up and can play it the first time. Others, like probably me, it would be a long process to learn it. But it's one of those things that I was a natural for it. For you, though, all you have to do is find the jeweler you trust. Gem Shopping's a great one because you can see right here, we are on site. We uh, do everything right here. This is uh, done in my office at Gem Shopping instead of my uh, office at home. So you are getting first class talent with all the right equipment done the right way. So if you're ex as excited about this as I am, this particular ring is going to be available in an up and coming video cast that I do. And if you are interested in it, let us know because one of the how do you series is going to be how do you size this ring. And if you want the ring, the sizing then, in that case, since I'll use this ring as the example, I'm going to do for free. Also, I'm going to be able to show you how to engrave the inside of the ring, which I will offer free as well if you want something engraved in it. But say you're buying it for um, a September birthstone gift for your daughter and you want to put, you know, love mom in it or something like that. That's what I'm talking about. I will show you how that's done and I will do that for you free as well. So thank you so much for 
joining me in this very first new and uh, refreshing way to be able to, to give you an education that you can carry forward in all your future purchases. And when you understand something, it makes it seem so much clearer what something goes through to bring you a product that is done right, done the correctly and really then adds an additional value to it.